English guests, the students from Nanyang Girls High School, National Junior College, Dunham High School, and St. Nicholas Girls School. Students and parents, we are thrilled to have this opportunity to come together and hear such a distinguished address. My name is Fiona Johnston, and I'm the Acting Head of Secondary School, and I'd like to hand over to Audrey Katzen, our school principal, to do the formal introduction. Thank you. give you a few of the ills we are facing in the world today and uh, with the hope that uh, as you progress with your life you can deal with them and create a, a better world than what we have today. The first problem, first issue I think we are all facing is this extreme inequality. We are of course very privileged all of us you know, to have People, health care, education, freedom of expression, of belief. In other words, human dignity. Every one of us is very proud to have his or her human dignity, as it should be. You know. But many people in the world are not fortunate to have this kind of life or even something similar to what we have. Uh, we have almost half the world population, about 2.8 billion or so, who live under $2 a day. And uh, you can imagine what you can do with $2. You might probably buy a real ice cream, you know, but uh, they have to make do with $2 a day. Uh, a lot of people, even worse, you have like 900 million who go to bed hungry again. You know, I 
again like this, one, almost one sixth of the world population. That, is that because we don't have the money? That's not the case. The world is full of money. We have a lot of money. It just, we spend it on the wrong, on the wrong things. Uh, last year we spent 1.7 trillion dollars, American, US money, on, on armaments. While we need just about 1% of this money to feed everyone. So, where are, are these the right priorities? Uh, we have, as you have seen, uh, and lots of refugees as a result of all these wars. Uh, we are not even feeding them. If you look recently, Refugee Agency, UNHCR, as they call it, has been almost begging everywhere to get like $8 billion to provide shelter, to provide food to refugees who live in Scotland, who are yearning to have a home anywhere. And yet they're not getting the money. That money is, as I said, it's like maybe quarter percent of quarter percent. So we have a very, in my view, a very skewed priorities. That is good. And that, again, I should tell you, is not just a question of conscience, a question of ethics. It's becoming a question of survival. You know, and again, practically, you know, if you want to live in a safe world, you want, we want to make sure that everybody is entitled to a decent life. Because we have seen and we continue to see when people are angry, when people are humiliated, when people are oppressed, and this is another thing I should say, not everybody is lucky enough to have kind of democratic institutions, freedom, you know, to express his or her views like we do. There's one third of the world nations who still live under an authoritarian system, dictatorial system. So when you get this poverty with repression or oppression, uh, what do you get? You get in many cases people are angry, people are losing hope, and then you you see the kind of extremism we are facing everywhere, everywhere increasingly. So you, you see stuff like ISIL, as you have surely heard about it, like Al Qaeda, like all these other renegades. Are we safe anywhere right now in this interconnected world? Of course not, as we have seen recently in Paris, as you see it everywhere. Uh, you cannot quarantine any part of the world because I mean, they are angry and they, are, they think they have been unfairly treated, not treated as human beings, and they do not act in many ways as human beings. Uh, human beings, as I said, you can see sometimes an environment that creates people like Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King or Gandhi and also the same environment that creates suicide bombing. You know, it depends the kind of environment, to my point, you know, where, what kind of, how are you treated? You know, if you're treated like human being, you act as human being. If you are not treated as human being, you don't, don't expect the person to act as human being. And then, so these, these are issues that if you are investing in fixing this inequality, you know, you are really also not just doing good for your conscience, you are doing good for your own or our planet's survival. Then another problem, of course, that we, the tendency is that we continue to settle our problems through war, you know. And this has been a perennial problem throughout recorded history. have been basically, killing each other, you know. If you now try to even remember what was the cause of, of war and 100 years ago, 200 years ago, most of us would not even remember the cause of the war. And 
in many cases, the states that were fighting these wars do not even exist. And yet, we still thought that this is the way to settle our differences. Do we really settle our differences through killing each other, fighting? Or is it better off that we sit together, like we are sitting here today, and discuss our problems, and try to find a solution? Again, I mentioned that we, we spent like $1.7 trillion on weapons. Uh, but part of that is being spent on nuclear weapons. Is this the kind of security system we would like to have? Do we have to depend on nuclear weapons? You know. And many of you, of course, know that the use of nuclear weapons could mean our self -destruction. The weapon used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, in Japan in the, during the Second World War, was a child plane in comparison with the far the modern nuclear weapon. And we thought after the end of the Cold War in 1990 that we are going to have a different global order, a different world, cooperative security. Unfortunately, that did not happen. We still today live in a world with 16,000 nuclear warheads, and 2,000 of them on so-called high status alert. It could be launched on a very short notice. Even if you get a report that there is a strike against you, uh, this could maybe give you half an hour, or give President Obama or Mr. Putin or half an hour and an hour to respond. And it could be a response to a computer error, false alarm, it could be unauthorized use, but we can wake up in the morning and discover that we are no longer in this. This is, to me, is absolutely crazy. And uh, despite all the good talks of all the politicians everywhere that we need the world free from nuclear weapons, and we are not really moving in that direction. So it's, uh, again, it's, it is this, and the issues are, are very much linked. I said, when you have inequity, and this inequity, by the way, is becoming more and more obscene, should I say. Okay. Right now, if you look at the statistics and numbers, next year, 1% of the world's population will, will own as much as all of us. That is, that is a frightening number. 1% will own as much as all of us. More, in fact, and not as much, more than, than all of us. They own more than 50%. You have now an, another figure which is even more awful that you have 80 people. You can put them in one bus, 80 people. They own as much as 3.5 billion. These are figures you should remember, you know, because. It doesn't show that we are on the right direction because whatever you call it, equity, social justice, uh, fairness, every, uh, and if you don't have a fair world, and if you are on the losing part of this thing, uh, then you know, put yourself into that situation of a person you know, who is not able to send his kids to school, who is not able to send his wife to get medical treatment, who is dying because he, the, he or he doesn't have enough, enough money to, to buy the medication. I mean, last year, for example, in, in Africa, is over two million people died simply because they don't have, they can't afford the medication, whether it's malaria, whether it's HIV, AIDS. The treatment is there, which is, which is the worst, but they can't, they just can't afford it. So it's a, it's not really exaggeration, it's a, it's a bit of an unfair word, but it's yeah, again an understatement. And it's it's a bit of a dangerous word, you know, because again we, we continue to to try to depend on on weapons that would lead us into what I usually say is sleepwalking to self destruction. And I continue to say that oppression. If you put oppression and poverty together, 
this is the most recent combination for violence and extremism. And so when you look and when you read and you study about you know, all these extremist groups or the evil we see in the world, it is not enough just to look at the symptoms. But it's very important to look at the causes. Why we have this kind of Why do we end up in this kind of well, I think simply it's a question of changing of our mindset. You know, in many in many ways, you know, we need to look at each other as part of the same human family as we are. You know. But right now we continue to look at us versus them. color, a different ethnicity, we are different. You know? And then we continue to fight. And of course that happens a lot because when people lose identity with the state, they have to find sen some sense of identity. And then they find that in their tribe, in their religion, in their whatever. They find the pretext you know, to find identity. And of course they are angry. And, and we see all these wars going on. Is the international community even trying to stop some of these wars? In many cases, as you see, people continue to die, you know, and there is no effort even by the United Nations or anybody because they are blocked. You know, it's all based on states looking for their own interests. Look at Syria, for example, in the last, last three years. 200,000 people died. Has anybody intervene to try at least to stop the bloodshed. Protect the innocent civilians, which I, I care the most about. We have, in the last decade, in Congo, I'm sure some of you have at least heard of Congo, but there's five, five million people died in the civil war. And I bet not, not a single person even heard about that, because it doesn't even get coverage in the news. And that's, again, part of the problem we face. It's depending, you know, our attitude, unfortunately, depending who is dying and where. If, if the person is one of us, a European, an American, you know, some you know, close to us, then we, we stand up, you know, and, and, and have a strong uh, reaction. You know. uh, if, if somebody is, you know, far away, well, we look at the television, couple of minutes and say it's awful and then we move on doing whatever we continue to do. But that that is not that has to change. That, as I said, that is it, the key to all that, you know, is a change of our your mindset to understand that it's we are all the same human family. I'm sure. And an international school of course you need to understand that very well. You come from different nationalities with different faiths, with different backgrounds. But you interact with each other and you discover you discover that you are, are all the same. You have the same hopes, you have the same aspirations, you want a future, you want a career, you want a family, whatever you want. And and you would like to have the freedom to pursue whatever you want to, to pursue. And that I think is the key to our salvation, should we say, is to come to grips with the idea that what really separates us is very superficial. It doesn't really matter what kind of background we have, what kind of face we, we believe in, as long as understand that we have in common is much, much more than what separates us. Uh, and try to understand that we, the only way to solve our differences is to sit together and negotiate and find a solution. We have, as we know in our life, in your family, in the school, you have to make compromises. You don't get your way 100%, you know. You have to see how things from the other point of view. And if you do that, then of course you find yourself. So these are some of the issues I would like to leave with you, that you have to think differently and act differently to create a better world, a world that's peaceful. We have to stop this. War that has 
in our trademark since recorded history. Uh, you know, we have to feel that there is some standards of social equity uh, that show there will be some people who are rich, some people, but at least everybody should have a minimum standard uh, of, of the basic needs. Yeah. So everybody should have his or her own dignity. Talk about democracy. To me, democracy is dignity. You know, it's, it's not, it's everybody should wake up in the morning and feel that he has all the rights he or she has, is entitled to, to speak her, his or her, or her own mind, to believe in whatever he or she wants to believe in, to have food on the table, to have education, to have spare time, you know, to have hope, to have equal opportunity. I mean, these are the kind of values you know, that you, you need to continue to work on. And at the end of the day, it is not a question of borders, it's a question which state you live. It's a question of empo human empowerment. You know, each one of us, everywhere in the world, should, should be empowered. And uh, that is a, a major shift in paradigm, a major shift in how how do you want to, to, to lead the work? I'm sure, and I have trust, that you are a different generation with the so social networking, with the kind of knowledge, education you have, it already started to think differently, and I assume emphasize with a lot of what I'm saying, because you are living that. You are living that particularly in a place like here. But that message, should expand beyond international school and into every part of society and whatever and whatever career you are going to have. And you have a responsibility. Every one of you has a responsibility. You cannot just say, well, what can I do? You can do a lot. You can do a lot. Even helping you know, a person in need, you know, a, 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 a handicapped person has a special, special need, you know, giving you know, a couple of dollars to person who, who need who need the help. You can speaking your mind, speaking to the politicians, speaking to the leaders in your countries of what you need to see, what the kind of world you would like to live in. So we should not, you could not uh, just say not your responsibility and saying I cannot do much, you know, because it's all this you this individual responsibility, human empowerment that we would be able to change our So I, again, I, I look at you, I see the future, I see hope, I, I see real change, and real change is what we need, real change to the better, to get the best out of, the best out of, of our human nature. I'm sure you see you in some time, you listen to some classical music, jazz music, you visit the museum, you see fantastic paintings, and you see how much creativity we have within us. But we have, unfortunately, also an impulse to our fights, you know, and we need, obviously, to control this impulse by creating an environment of checks and balances to make sure that we, we control that and try to emphasize the creativity, the, the compassion, the human solidarity that each one of us has in it. Again, it's a pleasure for me to be with you here, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I can say, Mr. Bernard is on Skype, and working Skype, we'll be trying to get questions from left to right. Dr. Alberati, thank you so much for the messages you've given us already. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to ask questions, but Dr. Alberati says, you know, using your voice and empowerment, so this is a great opportunity for us.
military junta that happened recently in your country? Well, I, I think, again, I, I talk about human empowerment, you know, and which means that we have to have a system that, that is based on uh, human solidarity. And I, you know, what any, any regime that is not based on social cohesion in society is not the right direction. So what I would like to see, obviously, in, in Egypt and everywhere in the world is, is a system of government where everybody is included. And that's, again, that's one of the challenges we, we continue to face, that you know, uh, we think we are, we want to prevail on our own, I mean, even at the national level. I mean, you have, unless you include everybody in society and provide them with the kind of equity, equality, you, it is not sustainable system because if you need to have economic development, if you need to have social justice, if, if you need to have law and order. What exactly is this? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, you, you, then, you then need to have, so it has to be, to, to me at the end of the day, when we talk about, you know, election, when we talk about democratic institutions, when, when we talk about the culture of democracy, it, these are not just luxuries. These are ways to make sure that everybody's voice is heard, that, that everybody is included. An inclusive society is the only viable society, is the only way to a future based on peace and dignity. Thank you. And the um, use that your career kind of uh, tries to get equally power out of the military and like the military power of um, Egypt what kind of diffused a lot of unrest. Um, do you think that was do you think the seizure of the government was necessary to stop a lot of chaos in the country? This again this you have to, I mean, this is not really the issue we're discussing here. However, we, this is, you know, the Arab Spring, if I can give you that. This is, again, a quest for human dignity by a large chunk of people. They are, again, coming out of a few decades of repression. So, if we still going, it, it's a work in progress. You know, that is, people are not, were, were in agreement of what they do not want, but they are not yet able to organize themselves in a way how we can live together, as I just mentioned, you know, and sort of the basic rules that they need to, to live by. So whether people in right, left, or center are, are still able to settle their differences under, you know, a properly agreed to constitution. Uh, I think what you see is, is a work of progress in this whole part of the world. And, uh, as we have learned, that is you know, moving from an authoritarian system to a democracy is not, is not something you can achieve overnight. You know, that is, that's a lesson. And people have to be, to understand that it's, it's an incremental process, that if you move from black to white, as the former president of Singapore was telling me yesterday, right, you have to go through a gray area. And I think that's, that's a gray area we still, this whole part of the world, some countries are better than others, but as you can see, there are even more, you know, more civil wars in places like Syria, in, in, in Libya, in Yemen, but, but there is a process started, and this process that people are saying we need our human dignity, and uh, it, might take, it might take some time. I mean, if you look at the history of Europe, if you look at the history of the US, if you look at the history of Asia, uh, it is, I mean, in Europe, it took 300 years, you know, for you know, for people to to end the fight between basically the emperor and the pope, you know, who have been you know trying to struggle. And you had 30 years civil war, a religious war, you had all kinds of things. But again, after people after killing each other, you know, they discovered that there is no other way but to live together. You know? I mean, they, they spent they spent millions of lives lost in vain 
before they realized that they have the better find a way to live together. And then, of course, they went through the, as you know, the religious reformation, Luther and Calvin and the age of reason, Renaissance, and uh, so there is, it's a very complex process until you reach the balance of how you can have a society is at peace with itself, is able to live together, everybody is having the kind of equity that he or she is entitled to, and the focus should be, as I said, on the creative part of humanity and not on the distracted part. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Everyone on this side. I'm going to go to one of our guests first. Good morning, sir. My name is Derek Chu from Dublin High School. Um, I'm inspired by our work in the International Atomic Energy Agency and the other various international governmental organizations I've worked in. Well, my question will be that. After the discovery of nuclear weapon facilities in Iran, USA has imposed quite a number of economic sanctions on them. So, so what do you think? How do you, how sustainable do you think the current measures taken by the IAEA to curb and restrict Iran's nuclear facilities are at this point in time? Yeah. Well, again, this is quite a complex issue to answer in, in one minute. But I can, I can tell you a couple of things that. Uh, one, I don't believe in sanctions because sanctions are no policy. Frankly, when you when you don't have a policy, you apply sanctions, and uh, and the same kind of thing you see, for example, in Russia. I mean, it doesn't. I haven't seen any issue having been resolved through apply, applying sanctions. In fact, sanctions is a result in hurting the innocent people. I've seen that in Iraq when there were sanctions, a lot of people died as a result of lack of food and medication. The regimes in power against whom sanction would apply, in fact, enrich themselves. You know, so sanction doesn't. You know, uh, what you need is to engage. You know, uh, the you know the, the party in question, and not just say, you know, I'm not talking to you. I'm going to apply sanction. And that was that was the case in Iran for many years. Luckily now, I mean, the U.S. and Iran, and at least these are the major players, and that are sitting together. Hopefully, they will work, find a, a solution. And it really is about regional security. It's about security. But again, Iran has to show that you know that they are fulfilling their obligation not to have nuclear weapons. But you also have to ask yourself the question: Is that, as I keep saying, I mean, you still have now nine nuclear weapon states who have committed themselves 45 years ago to get rid of nuclear weapons. They haven't done any of that. They still have 16,000 nuclear weapons. And is it is a system of security based on some are more equal than others a sustainable system? You know, that is that's a bit more fundamental question. That the, if countries see the big boys continue to rely on nuclear weapons, but telling them you cannot touch nuclear weapons, is that is that a system that is going to, to last? It's a, in my view, it is not because it's unfair. Anything in life which is not fair, which is not perceived to be fair, to be equitable, is not going to last. So let us hopefully resolve the Iranian issue, but let's again understand that by, for the weapon states to continue to rely on nuclear weapons, and you are sending a message to everybody around that if you are squeezed, if you're going through a conflict situation, you better maybe get yourself nuclear weapons because uh, unfortunately, it, what comes with nuclear weapons until today is power, prestige, and insurance policy that you are not going to be attacked. Again, yesterday I, I, I referred to the example of Iraq and North Korea. Iraq was in, attacked, was invaded, because they didn't have nuclear weapons. North Korea, because everybody knows they have nuclear weapons, nobody would touch it. You know? But it, that's the right message. I mean, the right message that if you want to protect yourself, irrespective of what whether the regime is awful or not, is, you know, you would be tempted to develop this kind of weapon. So we need to think, again, of a different kind of security by which we can protect ourselves, defend ourselves, but not have a reliable nuclear weapon that could accidentally end into a nuclear holocaust, where life would, would, would cease to be well, the same thing. We have planet A, as somebody was mentioning. We don't have planet B. You know that is 
that is that's a reality, and we have to protect that that environment. E even though we are not really doing as much, if I can mention again, on environment. I mean, look at the way we are treating the environment. You know, we are not doing as anything so far. You know, to really arrest this climate change which we see it everywhere. You know, and and yet we again we are applying the same kind of myopic national policy. You should do it first. Why should I do it? You know, you are responsible for it. But again, as again I mentioned yesterday, nature is not going to wait for us. You know, to settle our disagreement. You know, and uh, we uh, need to understand that our problems are common problems. Most of our problems right now, if you look at it, it's climate change, it's terrorism, it's uh, arms control, it's cyber attack, it's. Uh, they are all threats without borders, and not a single country is going to be able to resolve it in its own. And we need to understand, again, as as community of nations, that we need to work together, based on cooperation and not co and not confrontation. And that, again, the shift that we need to do. Thank you very much, sir. the future depends on you. Yeah. If we continue, if you continue the status quo, then the future doesn't look very bright, I should say. You know? uh, but you have to, you have to start again. You have to, you know, take the lead and and change the world. And again, I think some of what, what I'm saying, at least to my mind, is common sense. You know, you want to go to sleep knowing that many people, you know, are not able to to to, to have. You know, a meal at a day, a day you know. uh, are you comfortable that you go to the you know school knowing that a lot a lot of kids are not getting any education? Uh, are are you are you comfortable that that you you have health care knowing that millions millions of millions do not have health care and die prematurely? You know, uh, and even if, as I said, are, are you are you comfortable to see that? When you see right now, you know, that some of the symptoms that now we see in the 21st century, when you see that you have now a, a war in Europe, in, in Ukraine, for example, I mean, who could have imagined that we, in the 21st century we, we're going to use a force in Europe? You know, when you have something like this ISIL, you know, that's controlling a chunk of land as large as Switzerland, I mean, we, we see very ominous, you know, symptoms and uh, so it's in many ways it's a wake up call that you if we need to put I mean we or you frankly because the older generation has not really done very much and the politicians unfortunately do not think in long term. I mean all these issues are long term issues. They are not they are not short term issues the way politicians think of how it impact my prospect for election or, or what have you. So you need to start Thinking from now, you know, what kind of work, what what kind of life you want to have, you know, and what kind of environment you want to live, in, you know, and what kind of world you would like to share it with your other fellow human beings. So, it's it's a choice, it's priority, but you have to understand the cost and benefit of, of all of this.
I don't think, frankly, revision is, despite the fact that everybody's running around the Middle East saying I'm speaking in the name of this religion or that religion or that thing. I think this is all what we see is an expression of anger, you know, in you know, lack of good government, sense of humiliation, oppression. Uh, whether people carry the banner or wear the mantle of religion or ideology or ultra nationalism or color or race, I mean we have seen that throughout history. People are wearing different mantles to express their front frustration and to have it as a rally rallying force. You know, I don't think of any religion, whether it's Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, you name it, or or even just the four human values we share. Uh, condone violence. You know, uh, I mean, condone the kind of behavior we see. You know, uh, we obviously need, however, you know, to you know hit hard on all those who are using religion or using any, you know, and being able to counter that. You know, we need to counter that. That this is not, for example, in any way Islam or Judaism or, or whatever, or Buddhism, Buddhism, you know. Uh, but we have to understand that, you know, religion has been used over the years as a pretext, you know, century, as a pretext. And, you know, again, tribalism, you know, when you see like in Rwanda, one million people, you know, of, you know, Hutus and Tutsi kill, kill each other, you know. Uh, when, you, when you see color, which has been again in the U.S. civil rights movement, you know, and, I mean, in the U.S., it was the Declaration of Independence, but as a colleague of mine has mentioned, I mean, it was a republic, a slave republic for a hundred years, you know. Uh, so these are all, what should I say, it's a, uh, we continue to define what we mean by our human being. In 1960, Rosa Parks, a black woman in the US, was not able to ride in the front of the bus. And that's 30, 50, 60 years ago, 50 years ago. In, until 1954, in the US, schools were segregated. So there was schools for black, schools for white. And it was the same constitution who had, and the same Supreme Court who said, separate but equal in the late 19th century. And it's the same Supreme Court and the same Constitution who later in 1954 say separate right but, but equal is not Constitution because it doesn't provide adequate protection. It is segregation. So what I'm saying here is that we continue to discover what it means to be equal. We continue to discover what it means, what kind of rights we are entitled to, to, you know, as, a, as, as human beings. When I was a student in the US in the 60s, women's rights were the issue, you know. Again, women were treated, you know, completely, you know, in an unequal way with men until 1960s. And feminism was the issue, you know, where, where you know, there was a lot of, a lot of fun. Civil rights movement, again in the 1960s in the US to, to get black equal rights. So, and right now we continue to see a lot of calls again for different groups, you know, to be afforded equity, you know. Uh, gay people, for example, is still now some issue, you know, the, what kind of rights they should, you know, they should have equal rights. So we continue, this is a human journey to me. I mean, we, we, we there is no, there's no end of how we continue to try to define ourselves, try to define what kind of world we would like to have. Because we continue, I mean, that's again part of the excitement of the, of the human species. We continue to learn every day. You know, we continue to learn about our world. We continue to learn about our, ourselves. You know, and uh, the more we learn, the more we continue to, to redefine you know, our, the kind of life that we would like to have. We continue to redefine the values we, we would like to have. I mean, now we understand, again, for example, uh, when everybody should have absolute freedom of belief or lack of belief, 
that is that is something that has not been. I mean, people there was witch hunts in that, you know, not very far ago. You know, if you if you even express different belief, you know. So this is our history. Our history is that we we should be modest. We should understand that we we don't have a hold on the ultimate truth. The truth keeps changing all the time, you know. And truths are very rel relative in, in in many ways. But it's through education, through knowledge, that we we continue to improve. We continue to have a better. We continue to have to be better human beings, if you would like to say, better in the sense that we're becoming more peaceful, more ethical, more compassionate. You know, uh, and that's the way we, we should go. But you would you would take the mantle and you would move on, and hopefully you would move in the right direction. Uh, that uh, we have seen it hasn't always been a linear, linear, you know, life. I mean, I got a question, for example, about the Middle East and Egypt. I mean, we now understand that you know uprising or change is not you know it's not always a linear life. You know, it goes it goes back and forth. You know, until until you move forward. So, this is this is our this is our reality, and we have to accept that reality. But we should also always be encouraged to understand that you know, we can change the world. You know, yes, when Barack Obama said yes, we can, it is very true. Yes, we can. But you, yes, we can if we are empowered and endowed with the tools that allow us to change. And that primarily is education. Education and knowledge is the key to progress, to the creation of a world that's more humane, more secure, which I would hope that you uh, you would have as you are invited. Thank you very much. Do we have time for one more question? Good morning, sir. I'm Kay Yang from CHIV Business Girl School. And my question would be, what can we do as students to promote equity in Singapore? Well, I don't know what kind of equity you have in Singapore, but uh, I think you speak up. I mean, basically, what if you see any sort of inequity here, you have to speak up. You know, is it is economic equity, is it political inequity, or social inequity. I mean, you need you need to speak up. I mean, the way nobody is going to come and tell you, well, I, I'm going to give you this right or that right. You have to fight for it. I mean, that's again, you know, if you are, if you feel that anybody feels discriminated against in any way, or you feel a sense of inequity, you have to speak up, you have to organize, you have to, you know, and you have to continue to, to fight for what you think is your insight. That's the only way to change. Thank you. Okay. Got Peter, we'll come back to student action. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm sorry if this is unrelated, but I'd love to know what your reasons were behind your resignation of your vice presidency after only a month. Because, well, because I, as I said, I, as I mentioned, I always believe that we have to settle our differences in a peaceful way, that we have to have an inclusive society. I agreed to, you know, to, to join or to serve, basically to avoid what could have been a civil war, a society completely split. Then things did not go the way I thought it should go. It turned into violent, you know, violence and it turned into more a polarized society. And I obviously could not stay one day in such an environment because it, it goes contrary to all my own beliefs. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move to our little ones up here for a moment. We're gonna have a question from year seven. Yeah, probably the smarter guys. <laughs> The, the three of them are very eager, actually, so I'll have to go because I just had a girl, I've got a boy. Hi, my name is Ethan, and I am a local student representative for Year 7, and I'm from Australia. And my question is, who was your biggest inspiration when you were growing up? 
think that again, I get asked this question all the time. And I, and, uh, I mean, I don't think there is one person, frankly. I mean, my father, in a way, was an illustration. Uh, my university professor was an illustration. Uh, my first boss in, in my first job was an illustration. I, and it, it's, I mean, you get inspiration all the time. I mean, you get inspiration from very simple people. You know, you get inspiration from people whom you see are putting their heart and soul in doing their job or helping their families. And uh, it, you get you get an inspiration every day as you go along. You see you see the good part of of, of nature around you. So. It is not that you look at one person and say, this is my role model. I mean, you keep your eyes open and you see what good lessons you, you learn as you go, as you go every day. And as I said, you see it in one colleague of you, you see somebody who's sacrificing himself or himself to help their ailing brother or sister. I mean, you find somebody who is really dedicating his or her life to help the poor, you know, it's it's so many, you know, you know and uh, you see a lot of beautiful role models all the time. And the, the key is to act as a choker, you know, as a sponge, and learn this, learn these lessons and store it because you will use it something as 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 you put that to your life as, as you grow up. Well, I hope it would not happen again because that's where we come. We came very close to, you know, a nuclear war, a nuclear holocaust. I, a couple of months ago, I was giving McNamara Memorial Lecture at at University of Harvard in in, in the U.S. And as you know, McNamara was the Secretary of Defense during the missile, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, and that experience turned him into one of the most ardent advocates of nuclear disarmament. You know, he spent the rest of his life advocating you know, uh, human uh, nuclear disarmament. I, I quoted him, in fact, in my lecture, you know, one of his quotes, that human infallibility, human fallibility, you know, and nuclear weapons would lead to the destruction of nations. That is something I keep in mind all the time. And, uh, and as you have seen, and you probably can be, I mean, many of the people who have been involved in this whole Cold War development of nuclear weapons, people like Henry Kissing, like Bill Perry, who was the Secretary of Defense, they are all now very much strong advocates of, of nuclear weapons, uh, of nuclear disarmament. Uh, Bill Perry, who was Secretary, U.S. Secretary of Defense, said, you know, recently, that we managed to avoid nuclear holocaust by good luck more than by good management. Right? When you hear that kind of stuff coming from the person in charge of nuclear arsenal, but it gives you a pause to think and to strengthen your conviction that we need to move in a different way. you can do that in a very simple way by not allocating the necessary money for it. And as I said, this this money is not it's is less than one percent of what we spend. So I, a couple of days ago I was talking to some a business person here, you know, who's 
in charge of the stock exchange in fact and he is saying again the same that it is not at all the question of money to, to address poverty it's a question of whether we understand that we need you know to allocate the necessary resources and he was it actually said something which you know took me a bit by surprise they say that if i look at asia right now and if we do not build the economic and social infrastructure in Asia in the next 20 years, you might see the kind of situation you would see in the Middle East. Because again, that is, this is was a forward to me, you know, and uh, it's something which I didn't really think about, that you need to address poverty. I mean, because poverty, again, I keep repeating that, is the most lethal weapon of mass destruction, you know, and, and it is not. It, it is not in no way, I mean, 30 years ago, you know, all the rich countries, developed countries, so to speak, committed themselves that they will allocate 0.7% of their GDP gross domestic, yeah, gross, gross domestic product, 0.7% of their GDP to develop. Right, this is over 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago. Right now, there's only four or five countries who are doing that, and they are all the Nordic countries, the Sweden, uh, Norway, Denmark. The US, for example, is allocating 0.1%. Last year, huh, we spent in the US, in the US alone, on pet products, you know, food and stuff for dogs and cats. Uh, almost as much as we spent on the whole development assistance to, you know, to help alleviate poverty. But I love animals. I had a dog for 16 years. And, but, you know, I, I, you know, I spent a lot of money on that dog. But, but, <laughs> but again, you know, I, I, you know, frankly, I, every time I couldn't have thinking that I'm spending more money on that dog than we spent on tomatoes. But there's something wrong with it. But we'd like to take care of our pets, but we'd like also to take care of you.
we the students that have been um, organised to attend that session? And can I ask that you um, direct um, the, the students from uh, Nanyang uh, College uh, to the round table discussion in any three? South Africa. And, uh, I saw. I, I still remember that. I saw it on television in this museum, as they call it, the museum. You know, a question being asked at the time to the Prime Minister of South Africa, and he was asked, uh, "Do you think the black majority and the blacks there are a majority? There are 20 million. The, the whites are 4 million. You know, and uh, asked, uh, do you think they can participate in, in an election in a democratic process?" And his answer, no, they are barbarians, you know. That, is the, that was the mindset. Yet, of course, the, yeah, the South African had to, the black majority had to go to war, you know, uh, until, until they finally, the white realized that apartheid is unconscionable. It, 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 it is not, it has no future. And they have to, to find a way to build a new democratic society. And uh, 
I saw a couple of weeks ago actually in Vienna, WF de Klerk, who was the president of South Africa, the last white president of South Africa, who actually initiated change with Nelson Mandela at that time. And, uh, but I went after this museum, you just feel so angry to see how we treat each other. And uh, I went, I had a meeting afterwards after with uh, Mr. Zuma, who was the president of South Africa, still at that and, and still now. And I told him it was, I just, I couldn't understand how you managed after that, you know, to be able to reach a reconciliation process, you know, and be able to live together. And his answer, of course, was that we had somebody like Nelson Mandela, you know, who was preaching, you know, compassion, preaching reconciliation, looking to the future, you know, and they established this truth and reconciliation commission, you know, that when people came and confessed to the misdeed, crimes they committed, and they were, some of them were forgiven by the victims, but they looked to the future, you know, and they put this whole horrible, you know, past behind, you know, and I think that is, that's the way to do. Of course, you know, serious crimes, people have to be account, accountable for it. But you, you, if you want to resolve issues, don't dwell on the past. Don't get yourself completely obsessed by the past. But look to the future, because the past you cannot change. You know. The future you can, you can change. But, and the present you can change, but not the past. And that, I think, is a very, is a very important, pertinent point to make, that you, if you waste your time looking back, you know, oh, 10 years ago, or five years ago, my mother did that to me, or my brother did that to me, I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, that is, you can continue to dwell on that, and you commiserate about that, but it's not going to, to move things forward. The, the, the better way is to talk to each other and see how we can move forward to the future. Have a better relationship. Well, we need, we need both. I mean, I don't think there is a trade between, you know, freedom and economic rights or, or you know, basic needs. I mean, you, you cannot trade, you cannot trade that I will give you food and health care and education, but you, but I will tell you what to do, and you have no right to speak, and you have, you have no right to decide your future. I mean, I think this is both. We need both. We need both freedom, and we need both, the, you know, the economic rights and, and, and social. And in fact, you know, the communist system did not, in many ways, did not work at least in the Soviet Union. You know, and uh, and again, it's to my mind, it is a dying system. I mean, it had, uh, on theory. It's, it sounds very attractive. If you read Karl Marx and Engels, it sounds very attractive. But in practice, it, it, it goes, I guess, to human nature. I mean, people would like, to, would like to be free, would like to, you know, would like to feel this flexibility we have. I mean, you cannot just be treated as a robot, being told what to do, you know. And, and in fact, that, that in fact has an impact on your productivity. I mean, in the Soviet Union, they used to joke that uh, that they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. You know, <laughs> it, it was it was really a sham in, in many ways. And as we have discovered after the fall of the Soviet Union, if you look at Russia, if you look at the Eastern European, there were there were not really great economic development. A lot of money again was went into the wrong priorities, a lot of money spent on weapons, on armament, the army, but not on the social welfare even. Uh, so there was not, 
you know, the greatest social worker. I mean, they, yeah, I mean, maybe Germany, East Germany was a bit better because the German are hard working at least. You know, and, uh, but I tell you, I mean, again, uh, an anecdote about, again, East Germany at that time. I mean, after the end of the communist regime in East Germany, uh, they, op they had a horrible uh, intelligent agency called Stasi, you know, and uh, who used to, you know, the big brother who used to, you know, watch everybody. And they opened the fights for the people to go. I don't know if, uh, if you know this story, and, uh, but they opened the fight of the Stasi in, in, uh, to, so people go to see. And there was a woman who went to see her fight. And then she discovered that her husband was reporting on her for six years. So that's the kind of situation you you get. You know, that is, you know, you cannot even, you know, you cannot even trust your own family. And, uh, and as you remember, I mean, that's, although that's, again, during Hitler time, the, what do you call them, the, the use, the Nazi use? I think, yeah, I mean, again, they used to report on their parents. Uh, so any system that squash freedom, you know, that squash, you know, is, is a system that is doomed to fail. In my view. So you can defend saying, I feed you, but, you know, I'll take away your right. So thank you very much. I can, I, I like system that I can be free and still be able to produce and, and have enough food. Uh, I was just thinking because you talk a lot about how we need to have peace and make sure that countries and good relations in order to have like peace talks and peace, like to have peace talks and peace treaties in order to resolve issues rather than that they're using nuclear weapons and like bombing each other. But I was, I was just wondering to what extent do you think that we can use like violence to resolve these kind of issues? Because we know that to a certain extent we need like like some, uh, another country sovereignty to like save their own people. So what's your stance on it? So how much we can control violence, I think, is that the question? Is it how much we can justify violence? Yeah. Because with extremist groups like ISIS, for example. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean sure. I mean, unfortunately, sometimes you have to use violence. I mean, uh, but, I mean, that's not violence. That is really self-defense, if you like. You know, if, you, if you're dealing with a, a group like ISIS, for example, or an other extremist group, and we have this shining path in Peru, Red Brigade in Italy. I mean, once periodically you get this extremist, extremist group. I think in Germany it was Baden Meinhof. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, throughout recent history, you, you got lots of people. Yeah. And but the question, of course, you have to use force to control to squash this group. But this is a short-term solution. I mean, that's again I'm, what I'm trying to emphasize that. Okay, in squashing these groups is short-term solution because you are dealing with the symptoms. <coughs> the long-term solution is to try to understand what happened that led to the creation or the development of this group. Why are they becoming attractive? Why are they able to recruit people? And that obviously then goes into the questions we, we talk about, you know, equity, fairness, uh, uh, you know, poverty, all these uh, oppression, all these kinds of issues. Prove that our boys can talk as well. Uh, yeah. Hey, my name's Will, and Australia, Queensland. My question is in corrupt countries such as the Fall for example, is it the Western world's fault that they are like that, or is it their government's fault? Which country you mentioned? The Fall, for example. Fall. The Fall. The Fall, okay. No, it's it's primarily, of course, the the country's fault. That is because they don't have you know proper governance structure, probably anti-corruption measures, a good standard of living, accountability, transparency. But of course, the outside world also suffers responsibility because they contribute to that. I mean, they pay commissions, they pay bribery properties. So uh, again, these issues you need to. We need to apply the same standards, you know, so if you don't have corruption, 
in Australia. You should not go and corrupt people in Newport. Uh, and uh, that they, these are, you know, you need also to not just look at your own environment, but you look into that across the border environment. And uh, but it's it's primarily it's it's primarily that I mean the major culprit, of course, is the Middle East, if you like, you know, and uh, but. You know, and, and, and also a culture who is really contributing to the crime. You know, and that the people are ready to to, to pay bribe and you know and, and corrupt corrupt officials. You know. okay, I think I can talk about South Africa. So I'm going to question. Hi, um, I'm Danielle. I'm originally from South Africa, but my question isn't about South Africa. Um, my question has also relates to sovereignty. So you talked about that. Um, we have, on the one hand, we have some nations like um, the United States who tend to involve themselves in other nations' disputes. But we then got, we've got we nations who, sorry, there's nations who involve themselves frequently in other disputes of other nations. But then there are certain nations who use state sovereignty as an excuse not to involve themselves and assist other countries. Which method do you think is most helpful? And could you suggest alternatives to solving problems, like in other nations? I'm sorry, that's a very bad look. <laughs> Some people use sovereignty as an excuse for what? For um, staying within their country borders and not assisting other nations, like lower um, LEDCs or nations who um, have extremists living within their borders. Some nations refuse to help simply because they see it as not their problem. Alternatively, you have nations who um, involve themselves too much in well, I don't think it's a question of sovereignty, frankly. I mean, it's a question of compassion to me. It's, uh, you know, you can you can help yourself, you know, but you, you can help, help others. I mean, in, in many countries, I mean, in, in the West, at least, you know, the, or in some of the East, you, know, you still can help yourself and help others, you know, and uh, I don't think it's mutually exclusive, you know, and uh, if you see how much waste we have, you know, for example, in our daily life, you know, and how much little money we spend can make a difference in other places, you know. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I'll give you again a, an example, which maybe a personal example. I mean, again, it's, I live in Vienna right now, and sometimes if you go and, you know, have, uh, make a shoe, what do you call it? It's not ready made, it's, uh, Tailor made shoe, you know. There is a, a shop there that say, you know, <coughs> the starting price three thousand euros you know, for, for for the shoe. So that's the shoe, you know. Uh, <coughs> I saw in many developing countries uh, when people die, the government pays them compensation of five hundred euros. You know. And I I can't help, you know. I'd like once to get one of these shoes to see whether they can. You can maybe walk differently, but but you can't. You know, I, when you think that this is a shoe is worth, you know, six lives, eh? there is something. You know, I'd rather them give that money eh, to some of the poor people. So it is. I mean, it's not going to affect us. It may, I mean, we all of us can give little, you know, to to help. You know, at the national level, at the personal level, at the national level. But this is. I think this is the key switch we have to make, you know, <coughs> that these people are exactly like us, and we owe it to them to help. We are just fortunate. We could have been one of them. We're just fortunate when we are, we are born into a certain situation when our parents had enough money to, you know, to give us a good life, to allow, you know, permit us to have a proper education. But we could have been one of them. If we would have put ourselves in, in the shoes of any of these poor people, you know, uh, it would have made you know, a huge difference. You know, and in our attitude, my school in New York, where I went to the law school, the New York University Law School, I mean, they are having a system called global education. And I, I don't know if you have heard about it. Yet they have now a campus in Abu, Abu Dhabi in, in the Emirates. And it's it, that the that, that tuition there is it's free, free tuition. It's all paid by the Emiratis for, for some reason. And they 
Do you usually get each year 300 students back from all over the world? And the president of the university was telling me he was getting, you know, people who have, you know, have kids who are brilliant, but who have absolutely zero, you know, zero resources. So he got, a, a, I think, a Shishnian, you know, orphan, uh, a Ethiopian guy who who grew up in a cardboard of his own, and they are now, you know, at, they have this, you know, this campus where they have, I think, 300 students at every at every level, from like 60 or 70 nationalities, you know, and uh, they, they call it global education because they wanted people like international schools to get to get together and you know from all over, but they also want to give poor people a chance. And these guys, I mean, you're telling me, of course, they are, they will, I mean, their life will be completely different coming from, you know, being an orphan in Chechnya, you know, have zero future into getting a proper liberal arts education by a very quality university. And, so they, the, and they pay nothing for it. And it's one of the most competitive, in fact, schools right now to apply for. I think they get like, I don't know, three, four thousand a year, I think they get like 300. And it's based only on merit because they don't charge them anything. So there's a lot of ways we can at least help, help it get get people out of poverty or give them a, a chance, you know, to, to have a living you know, or, to, or to have a future. Good job. We've got some new eleven students who just completed their IGCSE and uh, one of the units they did was a a subject called Global Perspectives. A lot of what you've been talking about is very central to this subject. So I'm wondering if any of our year 11 students would like to ask Dr. Bell Baradine. Um, I'm Sarah, and I'm one of those year 11 students. Um, I was just wondering, in regard to the Institute for Economics and Peace, or the EUP's Global Peace Index of 2014, um, it says that the state of peace in our time has been slowly but steadily decreasing in recent years, specifically over the span of the last seven years. Um, you mentioned many examples um, of how oppression and poverty are a lethal combination and how, in your opinion, anything unfair um, won't last. Um, but I was wondering, um, in consideration of in the last year, um, we've seen a large increase in uh, terrorist activities and a trend where hostility um, has moved from hostility between states to um, an increase in the number of internal conflicts. And I was wondering whether you thought um, oppression and poverty combined or um, just the state of the governments were the reason that triggered this sudden increase? You mean the combination leads to, to what? Well, I was wondering um, what factors you thought were responsible for the increase in um, the terrorist activities and the internal conflicts. Yeah. <coughs> well, I think the continuation of that situation, this combination of poverty and oppression, you know, it leads to an explosion at one point, you know, and it's like a pressure cooker. And you know, at a certain point, the vapor comes out, you know, or it explodes. And I think, unfortunately, it's just like a domino effect in the Middle East. I mean, there are many, many issues at play. I mean, you have countries now, and maybe because you have the Syrian civil war, you have Libya is disintegrating, you have Iraq is fighting a sectarian fight, you have the Palestinian and the Israelis are on each other neck and killing each other, and. Uh, so it's, you have oppression in many of these places, and uh, you have poverty, you know, and, on, and, and again, in, in so many of these countries. So people lost hope, you know. I think, I think this, this is the question, is, as, I, as I mentioned. When you lose hope, then that is, that's the max. You can, you know, you can only work, I think, I don't know if I mentioned that, people, were are saying, as somebody was telling me the other day, that people are ready to accept sacrifice for one generation. You know, on the, if if they think that the next generation will will have a better life, they, kids or whatever, 
But if they lose hope, you know, then they will go, you know, they go crazy, you know. And and I think maybe my answer to you is that there is more people are losing hope because they haven't seen things are getting any better. You know, in fact, if if it, anything, it's getting worse. And uh, that's why you see this ISIL because it's crazy, but it maybe gives them some identity. But they lost any identity and any hope with anything, and they have the life has no meaning. So, if you tell them that this is now you, you know, you are part of this group and you are going to you know to spread the word of God or, or whatever it is, I mean, it gives them it gives them meaning to their life. You know, crazy as it is, but but that's that's a situation. Uh, because but because we haven't done anything, if you you know, on on the basic infrastructure of as I said, decency values, poverty, oppression, freedom, none of that, you know. And we see more and more coming out. And unless unless we see that to be, you know, a, a wake up call, we'll continue to see more in my view. Yeah, um so I'm Mark Robinson, I'm from the Alta School and I'm originally from John. So currently in Australia there's a reoccurring debate about Australia being more involved in storage enrichment and possible use of nuclear energy. What is your opinion on the most feasible direction for nuclear, nuclear energy in Australia? Okay, so Australia? Australia yeah. Well, I, I really don't have at hand, you know, the statistics about your energy needs, you know, but I can give you at least, you know, a, a general answer that it, it depends, you know, what sort of energy mix, mix you would like to have, you know, how much, you know, available, you know, conventional energy sources are, are available, what's the price, I mean, again, it depends many times. Now, oil and gas, for example, is, is dirt cheap, you know, uh, so, which doesn't make sense now to go for, for nuclear, because it's probably more expensive even. Uh, renewable is making a lot of progress, so, Solar. I'm sure we have a lot of solar and, and wind. So it's a, it's not an easy question. Again, it depends on the record or in, in the safety of <coughs> nuclear energy. Say for the next few years, it, uh, the technology is again developing into more safe nuclear technology. So whether to decide to go for nuclear now, whether you decide not to go for nuclear at all. Uh, whether you say, well, I'll wait for another five, 10 years to see a, a better technology and see how nuclear is faring. These are all considerations I think each government has, has to make. And different governments have reached different conclusions. I mean, you have Germany and France who are living side by side. Uh, Germany decided to walk away from nuclear after Fukushima and, and, and after uh, the, the nuclear accident there. France is relying on nuclear for 78% of its uh, electricity supply. And these are two countries, people live, have reached different conclusions. I mean, again, it's uh, people assess nuclear differently, that readiness to accept a certain deg degree of risk different from one country to the other. So these are all issues that I'm sure you, know, you would have to look at. And, and it's, country, it's very much country specific. Okay, um, hi, um, my name is Barry and I'm from Land Road High School. Um, it's an honor to speak to you guys. My question, um, I'll, I'll speak to a little bit more on um, I say my question, which is um, um, you spoke a lot about um, nuclear weaponry in your speech just now. And um, a lot of people just claim that um, nuclear weaponry is something that we use to protect ourselves um, as a form of defense rather than of um, aggression. And um, yet, we, um, when, we, um, when major powers, for example, the US and Russia, they are major power holders of um, nuclear weaponry, and um, they claim they use this claim as a stance. Um, but if we have nuclear weaponry ourselves, doesn't that make it available for those who are aggressive? For example, ISIS and Islamists, and um, um, those with like extremist behavior. And I agree with the point that um, war is just an example of petty human ignorance because um, as we can see from um, what happened during the uh, World War II um, when Japan attacked um, Southeast Asian countries, 
And um, later on, what happened was that um, no, no, no country stepped in till the point where um, Japan did something to the US, which was bomb Pearl Harbor. And that was the point that US um, stepped in and um, bombed Hiroshima. And um, to this day, we can see the grotesque and like marred bodies of people that have gone through radioactive radioactivity. And um, I would just like to know um, what you think is a way to solve this problem. Like, if we do not use nuclear weapons, um, what can we do? If we do not use it? Yeah. Because um, in a sense, it's a form of defense. But um, for example, if I take the example of US having um, guns, um, the gun policy, um, they allow the use of guns. But the thing is, um, they allow the use of guns to protect themselves. But it also gives a chance for people who want to attack others use guns as well. And in the same sense, um, nuclear weapons can be used in that kind of context. Well, I think it's a faulty argument. Because if you're saying we have nuclear weapon to protect ourselves, right? Yeah. Then everybody should have it. That's that would be the argument. If if you accept that nuclear is is a good thing to have to protect yourself, then you should allow every country. To this is an irritating thing. <laughs> <laughs> then everybody should have it. You know, and uh, if you think that uh, the world will have like two hundred or 192 countries or 200 countries, each one has nuclear weapons. What the odds in that situation that maybe tomorrow somebody will use it either by accident or you know computer or an unauthorized way. So you cannot really use the argument to say we are going to protect ourselves by nuclear weapons unless you allow everybody else. And then the other argument, of course, that you know even if states have it, the, the, the risk right now, and that's the most dangerous risk, that one of these extremist groups will get their hands on nuclear weapons. And if they do get their hands on nuclear weapons, they clearly are going to use it. Because this concept of deterrence, you know, if you attack me, I'll attack you, it doesn't apply to them. It's irrelevant to them. They have no return as if they're ready, ready to, to die. So if you look into all these considerations, you know, and uh, you would come to the conclusion, and as I said, as most of the people who have been involved in the US in the creation of development of nuclear weapons, have come now to the conclusion that uh, that the world is better off without nuclear weapons. Because <coughs> there is no, as they say, there is no learning curve with nuclear weapons. You, know, you can't learn with it. You, know. you mentioned Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I think this was horrible mistake. I mean, did you need, to, did they receive to use nuclear weapons against Russia? The war was gone almost won by that time. And we have seen, I'm sure you've said, we have seen if you've gone to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, these are inhumane weapons, you know, and uh, no matter what the situation, I don't think we should be in a situation where we have to use to kill, which as I said right now, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki bomb was sort of miniature nuclear weapons in comparison to what we have. Okay, I think you, you have a uh, question. Gentlemen, um, here's my question. Do you believe that people are inherently born with the ability to treat others as equals, with compassion, to care to care for others, or perhaps that we are born thinking selfishly and then we develop this, this capacity? How about you? Sorry? How about you? Uh, interesting question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Quite personally, we've been reading a lot of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and I believe that we're born inherently with both both sides of the spectrum, and then we decide which we, we tend to lean to. I I don't really know. How to, I mean, to understand the human psychology, you know, and whether we are born with a lot of goodness and no evil, or we are under certain circumstances, are acting. It, it, in my view, again, you know, and as much as I can gather, it, it depends on the environment. You know, I mean, we have seen cases, for example, when people were left stranded in the desert for without no food. I mean, they ended up, you know, turning cannibals, eating each other. I mean, which in the normal circumstances, you know, you would not even entertain the idea. But it happened, you know. So it depends on, you know, if you put people under stress 
And when you torture people, you know, they act, you know, they they act quite different. You know, if you treat people the kind of environment we have today, well, I hope you will behave. You know, because I again, it depends the environment. Either the environment try to get the best of you, or to try to get the worst of you. And yes, we do have. You know, depend on the environment. You know, uh, if you have a little cake like this, you know, and there's a hundred people fighting for it, and you will see the worst of us. You know, if you have a big cake which is enough for every one of us, we are we are going to act as hopefully so-called civilized. You know, and, uh, so it it that very much as I said depends on the environment, and that's why I could continue to keep talking about poverty, about equity, about fairness, and then you you also have to continue to have checks and balances. So you have to guard against the crazy ones. You know, we're always going to have, you know, and to make sure that we control their behavior. So we do not assume that everybody is going to behave the same under the same circumstances. There's always a minority who is going to act different, you know, because of whatever psychological reason. And even that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of our traits, human traits, qualities, are they nature or nurture? I mean, this is a question, you know, it's a very, very difficult to ask. You know, are we born this way or have we learned it along the way? You know, we don't know, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, we have to keep learning and, and getting knowledge because we have no answer and we have no no hold on the truth. I mean, all we, all we try is to try, you know, basically. My work. Uh, yeah, to promoting the safe use in terms of nuclear chemistry. So I guess you could say it's considerably resource inefficient that countries are spending such a great amount of money um, developing this type of science for the purpose of nuclear bombs. And usually when you mention the word nuclear, many people just come to the idea of mass destruction. But in a different situation, the same science could be used for better purposes such as um, radiotherapy and treating cancerous patients. So if so, is there a movement where we can shift um, these concentrated efforts into developing nuclear bombs, into promoting this radiotherapy in helping um, people who are sick, especially in underdeveloped countries where they can't um, receive this kind of form of treatment? Is there a way we can do that? And how so can we move forward? Like, is there driving well, again, it's the answer as Sarah's question. I mean, it's an old question. Where, how do you want to spend your, what is your priority? You know, I have seen, you know, this radiotherapy machine, which the, the International Atomic Energy Agency is doing, I continue to do until now, try to, you know, cobalt therapy and, you know, to treat people, you know, and uh, there is absolutely a lot, I mean, there's a lot of cancer incidents right now in the developing world, and there is not at all enough or sufficient treatment. I remember I was once in, I mean, I think in the, in the West, you know, there is sort of a nuclear center or a new, I mean, treatment center for every quarter of a million, a machine for, you know, for this uh, cobalt therapy machine for 250,000. I remember I, we, I was once in Ghana, for example, and you know, in, we had been do donating one machine there in a city called Kumasi in, in Ghana. And that machine was supposed to sell 10 million. And obviously, we 